Chile, a place with mountainous landscapes and hugging the Pacific coastline. The people here live a colourful and community orientated life, but this country still lives with the scars left behind from the coup. Back in the UK, I visited Leicester Central Library to find out how this horrific event might have affected the people living there at the time of the coup. Within this book, people recount their own personal torture during this time. One person says, they were blindfolded, then the blows start, on the face, on the legs. Some people come out totally covered in bruises. Another person explains how they received electric shocks and their left arm was dislocated because of the shaking the electric shocks produced. It stands that around 40,000 people were tortured and slash all survivors of political imprisonment during this time. And from reading these stories, it's not difficult to understand how the Chilean people might have felt abandoned during their country's time of need. In Chile, I visited the Museo de la Memoria, discovering that many media forms were banned, such as music, books, magazines, and even art. Many protests broke out on the streets in rebellion against the many human rights violations being committed. The total number of people officially recognised as disappeared in Chile, or killed, stands at 3,216. I spoke with Melanie Cruz, a lecturer in international politics at the University of Leicester. Could you tell us about how the coup in Chile came about, why did it happen, what kind of went on behind the politics there? So the coup happened on uh, September 11, 1973. So the main cause of this is the election of Salvador Allende. The election of Salvador Allende become this sort of international phenomenon. The main concern of the right parties was that the nationalization of industry particular natural resources that are very big in Chile, like copper and so on, will create a, a new economic model that will actually defy private property and uh, private companies. The involvement of the United States and uh, private companies in the country or the bourgeoisie in Chile, what they did was an alliance of blocking the economic system. We see a complete blockade of the national economy. So people couldn't get access to basic source like uh, goods, like meal, bread, and so on. And we have in 1973, the biggest um, lorry or truck strike, which actually stopped the national economy. Why was it that these human rights violations were allowed to go on for so long? How come the rest of the world didn't step in or those organi organizations didn't step in? So first of all, all these um, torture centers were clandestine and we didn't know about them until later in the 90s when we, we, we returned to democracy and survivors were allowed to speak about what happened to them. But there was very, there was no capacity for any international organization to interfere with what the state was doing in Chile. Yeah. So the country itself, it has come a distance from the coup, but it's very much still there. And there is still a lot that the country needs to do to progress and develop further. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that our political system is attached and constrained by the 1980s constitution. That is pretty atrocious in many, many levels uh, in terms of education rights, housing, freedoms, and so on. And we still continue to have that constitution. So our, our, our entire system of law and rule is based on principles build during that dictatorship. But it's also to think about how justice can be enacted in a country that doesn't really was able to acknowledge one of the biggest violations of human rights ever in our history. So those things combined have built a lot of, lot of tension and frustration in different communities and I will say across the country, yes.